Please turn with me to Obadiah. And as you're turning there, if you're using a pew Bible, it's found on page 921. We'll be reading verses um, 10 through 14 today. And before I ask you to stand while you're turning there, I'll just give you a brief overview of where we're headed. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll be finishing up Obadiah with verses 15 to the end. It is, after all, a short book, only three paragraphs. And then we have uh, two odd weeks, uh, in a sense, uh, between now and Easter. Uh, Easter, of course, is the 31st, and um, this year I've chosen what may be considered an odd text for uh, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, you know, I think it's fun to preach resurrection themes from perhaps non-traditional texts. Uh, I'm a bit of an eccentric in that way. Uh, you know, for a few years I was always finding Old Testament texts that foreshadowed the resurrection. Um, well, according to, my, I, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I have not preached this text before. I've decided to choose Revelation 20. <laughs> because John there, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says this is the first resurrection, verses 1 to 6, which will be my sermon text, and then later talks about the second resurrection. What on earth is that? So we'll explore that. And um, anyway, uh, I will be, I will warn you, I will be applying an amillennial hermeneutic to that and uh, from an idealistic uh, perspective, uh, which will take Terry by no surprise. But we do have those, I call them odd weeks, but March 17th and then March 24th. And then, um, so I didn't want to start the next book on, on the 17th because uh, Jim will be preaching for me on the 24th. Lord willing, I'll be in Taos uh, that week and um, doing pulpit supply for them as they're calling a new pastor, they hope, or interviewing a candidate. Uh, they need, a, need pulpit supply for that week. And so Jim will be preaching on John 1, the first five verses, John's prologue there, um, on the 24th. So I didn't want to start a new book on the 17th and then take two weeks off, right? Uh, so I've decided just to call an audible on March 17th. Uh, and I did warn you ahead of time, I reserved the right to preach uh, uh, topical sermons from time to time as the need may arise. And so I just picked something of a random text uh, for March 17th, which will be Proverbs 1, verses 1 through 7. Now, Terry's giving me the thumbs up because R.C. Sproul talked about Proverbs this morning in our Sunday school class on the video. But uh, I'm just going to do a random topical sermon on wisdom, on the ideas of wisdom in, in Proverbs. And I do believe Proverbs points us to Christ. All right? So don't forget to... See Christ in the Old Testament because he's there. He's all over the place. And then uh, Jim is up for the 24th, and then we have Easter on the 31st, and then uh, we will begin our new book in April, April 7th, Lord willing. And I do have uh, the next eight sermons uh, planned out, orders of worship planned out after April 7th, but I haven't assigned them dates yet because I haven't heard back from Robert Jolly. Uh, you may know... Robert Jolly is the pastor of the church I used to serve. Um, I, he, he came after I left, uh, so he's not the pastor under whom I serve. But I met him last year. Um, their, their church was scraping the bottom of the barrel. They didn't have anybody else to, to come preach, so they asked me to come do their uh, re annual revival services in February of last year. And so I wanted to extend the same courtesy to Robert and invite him to come out and preach for us. And he's expressed an interest in coming out here in April. But he doesn't know what week. So he's checking with his wife. He wants to bring his wife. So it's my hope that you will get to hear uh, Robert Jolly at some time in April. And uh, I thought we could take him out to White Sands. And he's never seen White Sands before. Um, and uh, I think you will enjoy being with him. Um, so anyway, we'll, we're, we hope to uh, get that figured out at some point. So... Uh, some of you know, Colleen and I are building a house in High Rolls, and it's not ready yet. Uh, we bought the land in December of 2022, and they started the dirt work, I think, in March. And uh, it's, the builder told us, drop dead date of December 1st. And that came in the way. They said, okay, December 20th. And that didn't work. And then he said, February 3rd, for sure this time. And that's nowhere close. Uh, so now we're in March. It's now March 3rd. And uh, I'm not even sure if they put... I'm not even sure they put the drywall in. So, you know, at this point, who knows? Um, I'm hoping I can take some time off in April uh, to, for us to move in. Uh, 
I'm not sure that's going to happen. It might be June at this point, who knows? But um, I do hope to take some vacation in at some point in April or who knows, May. Uh, and so whenever that gets, gets done. So I, I do have orders of worship planned out and uh, we'll get some pulpit supply hopefully uh, whenever I'm gone. So that's just a brief overview, some housekeeping for you. Um, and I trust uh, we can all look forward to the next uh, series together, a sermon series. So without further ado, would you kindly join me in standing, if you're able, uh, as I read our text this morning, Obadiah, verses 10 through 14. And this is the word of God. It is eternally true. Because of violence to your brother, Jacob, you, Edom, will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster. And do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives. And do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. you join me in prayer? Lord, speak to us, your servants here. May the words of my mouth and meditations on each of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. A few brief comments uh, about the text, and then I hope to get into application. Uh, I will warn you ahead of time, I have four points of application. The first three points of application have three subpoints. The fourth point has two subpoints, and then under the second subpoint, I have six sub subpoints. So this morning, it's going to be a Thomas Watson sermon. For those of you familiar with Thomas Watson, every, you know, the Puritans did this generally, but Thomas Watson was famous for Point, subpoint, 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 you know, <laughs> two hours later. Now, I did tell you, I, I will tell you up front, I am no Steve Lawson, but uh, when I, Matt Samori and I went to the G3 conference in Atlanta in September, and it was very enjoyable. Uh, Steve Lawson was one of the preachers, and uh, he's a Reformed Baptist, uh, but boy, it's fire and brimstone. I mean, he is just absolutely, in my view, just riveting. Whenever I hear him, I've heard him speak at a number of conferences now, and I just sit there enthralled. And I'll never forget, his sermon had five points. And I can't tell you what all five points were now, I must confess. But the second point had nine subpoints. Nine. I can't make this stuff up. Nine subpoints. But it was riveting. I mean, it was that. I was like, this is wonderful. You know, uh, I, I think I can't remember it because of my uh, intellectual deficiencies, you know. But uh, his preaching was wonderful. Now, I'll be first to admit, I am no Steve Lawson. So uh, you'll have to do with what you got here. But. Um, you remember Edom, of course, uh, the word Edom means red. Edom was descended from Esau. And Esau, of course, uh, his, his, the name Edom was a reference to the pottage in the old King James Version, uh, the stew, the red lentil stew, for which Esau sold his birthright in uh, Genesis 25. And so briefly, I wanna talk about some of the parallels between Edom and Esau, their forefather, uh, because the commentators will point out that there are similarities between the culture of and, and the, uh, the sins of Edom and the character of their ancestor, Esau. Esau, you remember in Genesis, uh, despised his birthright for the sake of of temporary worldly pleasure in the case 
in chapter 25 with food. Remember, he comes in, he's famished, and he says, I'm, I'm starving. And Jacob, ever crafty, says, oh, well, look, I've got some food here for you, brother. Uh, just one little thing. I, I'm happy to give you this delicious food, but I just need you to sell me your birthright. And Esau, not being eternally minded, said, well, what good is a birthright to me if I die of hunger? And so Jacob says, swear to it, swear to it. He says, okay, fine, whatever. And then so off he goes on his way. And one commentator, when I was doing some study on Genesis 25, one commentator points out that uh, the summary of that is that Esau ate and was filled and went on his way. And one commentator says, calls that a staccato style of summary statements indicating that Esau had no depth. Esau had no character. He was as uh, unconcerned with eternal things. Of course, the whole significance of the birthright <coughs> and later the blessing which Jacob stole was that it was rooted in the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, this commentator pointed out that Esau had no regard for the covenant, no regard for his covenant blessings, no regard for his covenant identity. Second, we note that Esau showed disregard for his covenant obligations by practicing polygamy, no less with foreign women in Genesis 26, and again with the daughter of Ishmael in Genesis 28. So we, we know that he had at least three wives. At first, he married the uh, two Hittite women, which of course was already uh, outside the bounds. Now, admittedly, Mosaic law had not been given yet, but you remember that Abraham was very intentional about making sure that Isaac did not marry a woman from the Canaanites. And uh, chapter 24, of course, is uh, Abraham sends his servant to go find a wife for Isaac, and she, he finds, of course, Rebekah. But Esau did not inherit his uh, grandfather's concern for uh, covenant uh, marriage within uh, the family that God had called in Abraham. And then, of course, after um, Jacob deceitfully steals the blessing on top of the birthright, uh, Esau goes out of his way. Even though he already has two wives, which was never, by the way, never endorsed by God, just for the record on that. Um, he goes out of his way to marry a descendant of Ishmael in chapter 28, verse 9, because, specifically because he sees that it would grieve his father. And so Esau here has not only disregard for his covenant obligations, but he is, uh, is malicious toward his father. And finally, we see in uh, Genesis 27 that Esau sought revenge. You remember after he, uh, Jacob steals his blessing, uh, he says, well, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, and after that, I'm going to kill my brother, Jacob. And that's the whole reason that uh, Rebekah goes to him, goes to Jacob, and says, you need to flee and go to my brother Laban. And, of course, he never sees her again or his father. Um, so Esau is not a man who's heavenly-minded. Esau is not uh, a man who's concerned about his covenant identity, being a descendant of Abraham, as Isaac was, and even Jacob later uh, even though Jacob at first, before he goes to Laban, uh, is clearly not someone who is a believer in the God of his father and grandfather. Later he, he is. Uh, but Esau does not have that faith. So, uh, in the same way, the descendants of Esau mirror his character. One commentator points out that the, 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 if we could summarize Esau's character in this commentator's words it's like the spirit of the world that John describes in 1 John chapter 2 the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life John says it's not the spirit of Christ but the spirit of the world and all those things certainly characterize Edom as they characterized Esau now, you may remember as the Israelites were coming out of Egypt in Numbers chapter 20, they request to pass through Edom, and the Edomites deny them passage. They make them go all the way around the Dead Sea. Nevertheless, in Deuteronomy 23, Israel was commanded to allow Edomites to be in their assembly. 
Now, I won't get into the weeds on this, but uh, they were called to show kindness to Edom on the basis that they were Israel's brother. So even though there was hostility between Edom and Israel that lasted as long as Edom uh, lived, and you remember uh, that their descendants were ultimately wiped out when Titus destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. I remember they were conquered by the Nabataeans in the third century BC. They fled to the north. Uh, the Romans gave them the name Idumeans. You can see the etymological relationship there between Edom and Idumea. Uh, and then they later sought refuge in Jerusalem during the Roman wars and joined with the Israelites to fight the Romans. And as one commentator pointed out, ironically were uh, slaughtered defending the very city that they had so often <coughs> invaded and attacked over the centuries. Uh, one other observation here in the text before we get to the application. Um, the, all right, I, I will admit to you up front, I am not a Hebrew scholar. All right, I only had three Hebrew classes in seminary. Uh, I do not have a PhD in Hebrew studies. But I know enough to know that um, the difficulties in interpreting the Old Testament are a little different than they are in interpreting the New Testament. Um, Fortunately, on, on the good side of the ledger, we have a lot more manuscript uniformity uh, with the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, than we do in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we have no less than five distinct families of manuscripts um, that offer alternate re uh, readings. We have more unity in the, in the Old Testament. However, there's a caveat. The downside of that is that there is more uh, fluidity in the way you interpret particularly Hebrew verbs, right? So Hebrew verbs have more elasticity, and so uh, translators have to make more decisions uh, in the way they render them. And I'm gonna give you one example. Uh, in your text, uh, in verses, um, in verse 11, there's a verb, uh, excuse me, a noun there in verse 11 that is translated two different ways. Uh, nouns in Hebrew also have some elasticity. <laughs> Uh, there's some nouns in the Old Testament that translators know virtually nothing about. Uh, one of the more famous examples is the Shephanim. What are the Shephanim? No one knows what that is. Uh, in the Psalms, sometimes that word is rendered as uh, rock badgers. In other places, it's rendered as conies, which are a bird. Uh, well, is it a bird or is it a mammal? Uh, we don't know. Um, but there's a word rendered in verse 11 and, and, and the second phrase there. Your, your pew Bible, the American Standard, renders that word as wealth. And, and other translations, uh, that for, for example, the New King James, renders that verb, that noun rather, as forces, meaning military forces. Now I'm only bringing this up to say ver that word, which is debatable, does it mean wealth or does it mean forces? Well, that word is one of the arguments people use to date this in the ninth century rather than the 6th century. And I'm certain, I told you last week, I have no intention of trying to start a new denomination on the basis of when Obadiah is dated. It's, it's a difficult book to date. Some have argued that that word in verse 11 should be rendered as forces, meaning military forces, which would indicate uh, that it's uh, not a, uh, it, it's not the um, destruction of Jerusalem in 586, but rather the attack of Jerusalem under the reign of Jehoram in the 9th century. But uh, the other verb uh, differences in, in translations is in verses 12 to 14. Your pew translation, the New American Standard, for example, renders that as a negative present imperative. Do not do this, do not do that. This would be called rhetorical retrospect. Now in verses 12 to 14, when in your New American Standard, the, the translators render that, do not gloat over your brother's day, do not rejoice, do not enter the gate of my people, do not loot. The idea is that they've already done it. They've already done it. Clearly they've already done these things. And so what the translators do here is they render the, these verbs as rhetorical retrospect, meaning they, uh, in light of what they've already done, the prophet says, don't do these things because I'm gonna, God's gonna punish you for it. Well, they've already done it. But it's called rhetorical retrospect because um, God is, through the prophet, uh, rebuking them for what they've already done. 
but it's framed, the, the translators of the American Standard rendered that as a present imperative for rhetorical purposes. Now, I gave you the example of the New King James, just staying with that example. Uh, the New King James renders these verbs as negative perfect imperative, by which I mean, they, they, it renders that, those phrases, you should not have gloated. You should not have entered the gate of Jerusalem. You should not have looted it. And so there, the New, American, the New King James translating, uh, Translation Committee said that that verbal structure is really perfect in its sense, looking back and saying, you've already done it, I know you've already done it, and you shouldn't have done it, because now God's going to judge you. All right, just a quick thing there. Um, okay, in the application, number one, God's judgments are always correlated with specific actions. Number one, God's judgments are always correlated with specific actions. In verse 10, he says, because of violence to your brother Jacob. Now, there's a progression here. Verse 10, it's a summary. In verse 11, it's the indictment. You two were as one of them. And then verses 12 through 14 is a restatement of the specific actions. So this is typical in Hebrew uh, style. In Hebrew style, uh, there will be a summary statement. And then they will go, the author will go back and elaborate on what the summary statement summarizes. Okay? So the summary statement here is in verse 10. All right? uh, because of violence done, you'll be covered with shame and you'll be cut off forever. Now, verse 11 is the indictment. Why? Why will they be covered with shame and cut off? Because on the day that you stood aloof, you were as one of them. And then the specific description is in verses 12 to 14, and it lists six things that they did. Note here that God's judgment is both subjective and objective. The subjective element is the shame. The objective element is they will be cut off. Now, when that verb cut off is applied to God's people in the Mosaic law, it has the idea of disciplinary action for sin. So someone who is uh, engages in a particular transgression of the Mosaic law will be cut off from his people. It means he'll be separated from the covenant community. But here he's speaking to Edom. Edom is not part of the covenant community. And here the idea of being cut off is the idea of being destroyed. But note that it has both a subject of, of, subjective element, which is shame. They'll receive public shame before other nations for what they did to Israel. And they will have an objective element, which is that they'll be objectively destroyed as a nation. Notice here that in verse 11, Edom's passive standing aloof is considered to be equal to active participation in Jerusalem's invasion. There passive standing aloof is considered to be equal to the active participation in Jerusalem's invasion. So the prophet here is saying, even though you are not uh, of the people who uh, actively invaded, presumably, you were, by standing aloof, you did not, um, you were considered equally guilty. Now, of course, uh, it does say uh, down in uh, verse 13, do not enter the gate of my people. So arguably in verse 13, they had some involvement in joining. Uh, and if you, again, if you date this in the ninth century, uh, it was the Philistines and the Arabs that attacked Jerusalem under the reign of Jehoram. If you subscribe to the view that it was in the sixth century, then they would have joined with the, the, with the uh, Babylonians. Okay. Um, James mentions this concept. Uh, it's, it's what we call the sin of omission. Remember he says in Chapter 4, verse 17, the one who knows the good to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Point number two, God's judgments always rebuke pride. God's judgments always rebuke pride. Uh, so notice the language in verses 12 and 13. Do not gloat, do not boast, and again in verse um, 13, do not gloat. So this, the, this is speaking of an attitude of pride. God's judgment is always rebuke pride. Notice the correlation between Edom's pride and God's judgment of shame. One of the Puritans pointed out that God's judgments always fit perfectly with the sins they're given to rebuke. Edom was proud, proud. He was lifted up in his heart. 
And as a result, the, the corresponding judgment for that is God's shame. His judgment will bring shame upon them because they are proud. Notice that pride is involved with every expression of sin to one degree or another. Some have argued that pride should be regarded as the root of all sins. Now, whether or not that is indeed the case philosophically or necessarily, we can all agree that sin, uh, that pride is involved in every expression of sin, whether individual or corporate, whether it's the sin of commission or the sin of omission, whether it is intentional or inadvertent. Pride in some way is tied up with every expression of sin. In our shorter catechism, we define sin as any transgression of or want of conformity unto the law of God. And certainly pride would be involved with every expression of that. We would also agree that sins of the heart only differ from sins of action in degree, but not in kind. Sins of the heart only differ from sins of action in degree, but not in kind. This is the principle Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount. When he says, you've heard it said, do not do this, outward expression of sin. But I say to you, even the inward heart is of the same kind. It only differs in degree. Love your, uh, do not murder. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother. I do not commit adultery, but anyone who lusts in his heart, right? Covetousness is the root of theft, among other things, right? It's the desire to have something someone else wants that leads one to steal, but covetousness is the root. All of these are of the same kind. Number one, God's judgments are always correlated with specific actions. Number two, God's judgments always rebuke pride. Number three, God's temporal judgments typify his ultimate judgment. God's temporal judgments typify or foreshadow his ultimate judgment. Once announced, God judgments, God's judgments are inescapable. Now, some of you will, will, will dicker with me on this and say, well, what about Moses changing God's mind, right? Remember, he says, I'm going to get rid of all these people after the golden calf, chapter 32 of Exodus. I'm going to get rid of these people. I'm going to start over with you. And Moses pleads with God and says, but don't do this. And then the scripture tells us God changed his mind. All right. Well, without getting into the weeds on that, I think we can all agree that at some point, God's ultimate judgment through Christ, the day of judgment in which all the nations will be separated as sheep from goats is inescapable, right? No amount of pleading on... Our part, or Moses' part, is going to defer, deter God from the day of judgment, right? We know that Scripture announces that God has set a day in which he will judge the world through Christ. And that is inescapable. God's judgments are rooted in his character. It's been said that holiness is God's fundamental attribute. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God's judgment is rooted in his character, whether it is temporal or eternal. God judges between individuals and nations because he is perfectly holy. In fact, God can do no other. It would be out of keeping with God's character to fail to judge. But finally, God's judgments call us to flee to God's mercy in Christ. This is why James, to whom I alluded earlier, says mercy triumphs over judgment. Well, how does mercy triumph over judgment? Through Christ. In the gospel, this is why Paul can take the same idea and say, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. Judgment on sin is not God's final revelation, his mercy in Christ is his final word, and we are called to flee to him. And in evangelism, we present Christ to others and say, as Peter did on the day of Pentecost, flee the wrath to come. Save yourselves from this perverse generation, by which Peter meant save yourselves from God's judgment. 
Number one, God's judgments are always correlated with specific actions. Two, God's judgments always rebuke pride. Three, God's temporal judgments typify his ultimate judgment. And number four, God's judgment on his enemies are inversely correlated to his blessings on his people. God's judgments on his enemies are inversely related to his blessings on his people. Now, strictly speaking, Obadiah does not elaborate on this, but I believe it's legitimate for me to point this out because the, the cursings against Edom, now follow the logic with me here, his, the cursings against Edom are rooted in the Abrahamic covenant, are they not? Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and those who curse you, I will curse. Now, the reason for this, we understand through the lens of the New Testament, is because God has bound himself to us in Christ. And so, because God has bound himself to us in redemption, Christ's crucifixion, Christ's death is our death, Christ's resurrection is our resurrection, Christ's ascension is our ascension, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us as our righteousness now, which is, as Luther called it, alien righteousness. So because uh, God has bound himself to us in covenant, those who persecute his people are persecuting him. That's why Christ interrupted Paul on the way to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's because Paul was, Saul was persecuting Christ's people. And so he says, because and those who bless his people, God will bless. And those who persecute God's people, God will curse. So the first full, full iteration of this, arguably, is in the Abrahamic covenant. But notice that the blessings, that each covenant comes with blessings and curses as we go through Scripture. And so in Christ... The blessings of the new covenant exceed the blessings of all the previous covenants. The blessings under the new covenant exceed the blessings of all the previous covenants. Now consider this with me. We believe that the covenant of grace is in response to, and just bear with me on that language, those of you who want to get really persnickety and split hairs with me on this, all right. We understand that underneath the covenant of grace is the covenant of works, right? Adam sins in the covenant of works, right? God says, don't eat of the tree or you'll die, right? That's the covenant of works, right? And so the covenant of works says if Adam had obeyed, he would not have fallen and thus we would not have fallen in him. But what would have happened if Adam had not sinned. Well, if Adam had not sinned, presumably his righteousness, by which I mean his obedience, would have allowed those who were in him to remain in covenant with God. But consider with me the idea that in the covenant of grace, the blessings of the covenant of grace exceed what would have been the blessings of the covenant of works. Because... In the covenant of works, if Adam had not fallen, the basis of our standing before God would simply have been Adam's human obedience. But, follow the logic with me, in the new covenant, or in the covenant of grace, the blessings that come to us ultimately through the new covenant are the blessings of Christ on the virtue of his obedience in the hypostatic union. In other words, the blessings that come to us in the new covenant, the covenant of grace, most fully expressed in the new covenant, are the result of Christ's active obedience of the law, which he performed in the hypostatic union, truly God and truly man. Therefore, the blessings that come through him are greater than the covenant of works, the blessings that would have come from Adam, because Adam was only a man, whereas Christ is truly man and truly God. So in the covenant of grace, we have six iterations. We have the Adamic covenant, and the, the blessings of the Adamic covenant fall short of the blessings of the new covenant. Why? Because in the Adamic covenant, God simply says that he's going to put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. 
Whereas under the new covenant, we have not just enmity with Satan, but we have new natures, do we not? We have new natures. God says in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, I will give you a new heart. Not like the heart of stone, but I will give you a heart of flesh. There is a transformation that takes place. Now, all of this, of course, is in seed form in the Adamic covenant, but just follow the logic with me. I'm, I'm trying to get you to see that as the covenant of grace progresses in redemptive history, it doesn't differ in kind from the old, but it differs in degree. There's a fuller understanding of the new covenant. The blessings of the uh, new covenant are greater than the blessings of the Noahic covenant because under Noah, we have only an external framework for redemption in the various spheres of creation, right? But whereas in the new covenant, we have the fullness of the substance itself, which is Christ. So as Paul says in Ephesians, he has given him as head over all things, that's Christ, to the church. So you have not only an external framework, but you have the substance of redemption itself in Christ. In a similar way, the blessings of the new covenant exceed the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant because God's people in Christ not only have, in contrast to the Abrahamic covenant, a right to an earthly land, but we have a city which has foundations whose architect and builder is God. As the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11 verses 8 through 10. What did God promise Abraham? All he could promise, I say could, all he did promise Abraham was a land. Well, what's the significance of the land? Is it not the sphere in which God reveals his redemption? What's the sphere in which God reveals his redemption in Christ under the new covenant? Is it not the church? Is it not the people of God from every tongue, tribe, and nation? And is it not, as Paul says in Romans, Abraham became the heir of the world? The land, I would submit for your consideration, is only a type of the new creation in Christ. The blessings of the new covenant exceed those of the Mosaic covenant because unlike the Mosaic covenant, which could only, for example, in Deuteronomy 28, offer material prosperity for imperfect obedience to external laws, the new covenant gives us eternal blessings of union with Christ and the fruit of the Spirit by virtue of Christ's active and passive obedience. In other words, the blessings of the Mosaic covenant, as good as they were, were only earthly in character, not heavenly. They were only temporal in nature, not eternal. They were only material in nature, not in spiritual nature. And so this is one reason why we consider the so-called prosperity gospel not to be, uh, to be inferior to the biblical gospel of the new covenant because it's in many ways stuck in the Mosaic covenant. The, Mosa the prosperity preachers, for all of their other errors, are, are stuck in the Mosaic Covenant because they, they take texts from the Old Testament and they say, look, God will bless you with material prosperity. Well, it's true that if God's people obeyed him imperfectly, according to the external standards of the Mosaic Law, they would be blessed materially. But I trust you understand that under the New Covenant, God has given us greater blessings than those, not less. You think material blessings are greater than what we have in Ephesians 1? Which would you rather have? <clears throat> Ephesians 1 or Mercedes? Really? You want, you want a Mercedes? Terry's not sure. <laughs> he sees me, I know. I mean, do you think Joel Osteen really thinks that a Mercedes Benz is greater than the blessings of union with Christ? Yes, I do. Finally, the blessings of the new covenant surpass even those of the Davidic because we are no longer ruled by a sinful king in a fallen world, but we are ruled by a perfect king who will ultimately be revealed and have his final reign in a new heavens and a new earth, Re ultimately redeemed. So brothers and sisters, we do not believe that the New Covenant, I do not believe, and our tradition does not believe, that the blessings of the New Covenant are something totally different than what came before, but greater in degree. Greater in degree. In Christ, we have the fullness of life. In Christ, we have the greatest expression of God's grace. 
And so when we read Obadiah or any of the other prophets, it's pointing to, ultimately, Christ. The ultimate blessings that the prophets offer are not blessings of a land and material blessings or an earthly kingdom, but the ultimate reality of Christ reigning in the hearts of his people, reigning in and through the church, and however you understand the end of it, increasing his reign until the day of Christ. Edom had temporal curses, but those who reject Christ have ultimate curses. This is why we share the gospel with people, among others. Those who are outside of Christ have an even darker outlook than Edom did. But those who are in Christ have an even greater hope than what Israel had under the Mosaic Covenant. Because strictly speaking, under the Mosaic Covenant, the greatest thing Israel could look forward to are the earthly blessings of Deuteronomy 28. Do you think what you have is, is, is better than Deuteronomy 28? I would say so. It's not less. Don't let the guys on the TV tell you that what they're offering you is greater. It's not. It's less. In my opinion, one reason why we have, I don't think you quite understand how many people around the world are being led astray by the so-called prosperity gospel. It's a real problem. And in my view, the reason they're fair game for that is because they have a deficient view of the blessings of the new covenant. Yeah. They don't understand the blessings of the new covenant. God is giving you something greater in Christ, not less. So when we read the prophets, when we read Obadiah, as obscure as it is, it's pointing to Christ. And the, the curses that come through the prophets are only a small shadow of the curses that will be, that await those who are outside of Christ. And so brothers and sisters, flee to Christ, but commend Christ to those you don't know. Because what awaits them is a worse judgment than the judgment of Edom. What Christ offers us is far greater than even the blessings of Israel. Would you join me in prayer? Open our eyes, we pray, Lord, that we would behold wonderful things out of your law. And give us grace that we would see the greatest blessing, which is Christ. We pray in his name, amen.